Welcome gamers! Jay from Gamer Grade here, bringing you a video on a recent game I've been playing and completely sucked into actually, called Everybody's Gone to the Rapture. Great, great game, especially if you like stories, um, but if you haven't heard of it before, then you should know it's basically a slow interactive story. So that may put some of you off already. Um, a quick heads up, this video obviously contains massive spoilers, um, so please don't watch if you still haven't played the game and want to work out everything for yourself. Um, so as I said earlier, it's, it's basically a slow interactive emotional story and tells the tale of two stories cleverly interwoven and drip fed to the player. The first of the two stories describes in emotional detail about the people who reside in a fictional valley named Yorton. This valley is located in Shropshire in England. The time period of the story is set in the 1980s. The second of the two stories tells the apocalyptic event, basically the rapture that caused everyone in the valley to disappear. There's six chapters in total telling the story of six residents of Yorton as follows. Chapter one tells the story of Father Jeremy Wheeler, local parishioner. Chapter 2 tells the story of a widow named Wendy Boyles. Chapter 3 tells the story of Frank Appleton. Chapter 4 tells the story of Lizzie Graves. Chapter 5 tells the story of Stephen Appleton. And Chapter 6 tells the story of Dr. Kate Collins. As you probably noticed, the game has been sped up to approximately three times the actual speed. And only chapters 1 Jeremy, 2 Wendy and 3 Frank are shown. You will not see the final three chapters in this video. This is so the video is a reasonable length and just long enough for me to describe all the events that occurred. Okay, so the stories are drip fed to you in various forms as you explore the deserted streets, farms and various areas of Yorton Valley. You'll come across phone messages, radio conversations, written events as well as witness spiritual echoes of the past presented with light. This orb of light also acts as your general guide. Although there is no order to do things, sometimes you'll witness a crucial conversation before you fully understand what it is that makes it so important. So exploring and listening to every piece of information is vital to get the most out of the story. Some of the memory echoes take place recent to the apocalyptic event, while others take place years before. You have to listen, read carefully and try and piece them together in order for them to make sense. Um, it is easy to miss vital bits of story information, which is why the game designers decided to make movement slow. Um, it's actually almost too slow at times. Um, however, this will prevent you from quickly running through areas and missing the point of the game. Ultimately, it encourages more exploration. It's imperative to have subtitles enabled so you can easily identify which character is saying what. Um, it is a good thing that they slowed the, um, the movement of the main character down because the amount of detail they've put into the environments um, is astounding and definitely worth uh, exploring just for that. Okay, so the basics of the story is there are two scientists in the game, Stephen Appleton and his wife, Dr. Kate Collins. Uh, they're actually married, they met in America. Kate is American. And uh, Kate agreed to live with Stephen in Shropshire to work at the Vallis Observatory so they can concentrate on decoding numerical patterns in the stars and related astronomy theories. So they're both scientists. Uh, then you have uh, another main character is Wendy Boyles, is a widow in her 70s and is Stephen's mother. She's a confident woman who seems to like sticking her oil in other people's business. Wendy's brother, Frank Appleton, um, which is obviously Stephen's uncle, owns a farm in Yorton. In recent events he sadly lost his wife Mary to a terminal illness. Father Jeremy Wheeler is the local parishioner and is dealing with a crisis of faith. Um, and the other main character is Lizzie Graves who runs the lakeside holiday camp in the valley. She and Stephen were once in love but Stephen uh, left her after moving to America where he later married Kate. Okay, on to the event itself. Um, the, the pattern, it's also known as, um, or the end of the world as the residents seem to think it's about. Um, the event is basically the rapture, as I 
previously mentioned, it's the mysterious apocalypse that is the focus of the game's primary storyline. It begins when Stephen and Kate, the two main characters, discover a pattern in the stars during a celestial event and then amplify it using the telescopes at the Vallis Observatory. In doing so, they release a form of intelligent light energy known as the pattern, which begins to aggressively spread through the valley. The pattern quickly adapts to travel faster and farther, all while infecting and eventually consuming every human with which it comes into contact. Upon first amplifying the pattern at the observatory, both Stephen and Kate are burned by radiation from the telescope. The burns from a pattern on their faces are likely the same pattern that's found strewn all about Yorton in the game. Stephen and Kate have an argument about what to do next, and Stephen leaves to see what's happening outside, while Kate locks herself in the observatory to continue studying the pattern. Uh, in an attempt to figure out what it is. Stephen soon realises that the pattern is manifesting itself outside of the observatory and all across the valley. Alarmed, he races on his bicycle from place to place, attempting to judge the extent of the pattern's spread and what kind of damage it may cause. At first, the pattern seems to try travelling through birds and soon all the birds in the valley are dead. Meanwhile, people have begun to disappear all around Yorton. First it's some people up at the Yorton holiday camp, which Lizzie runs, uh, then an elderly lady named Mrs. Borton. Soon more disappear after. Eventually Stephen learns the symptoms that accompany human contact with the pattern. People start by getting nosebleeds and headaches and begin hemorrhaging and eventually die or disappear. He spreads charts and maps all about his house, keeping track of markers he's seen around the valley and places where the pattern has turned up all while desperately trying to find a way to stop its spread. Stephen contacts a man named Clive Smith who works for the local emergency measures committee EMC and convinces Clive to enact a quarantine on the entire valley. As a cover the EMC tells everyone there's a flu outbreak. Stephen then determines that the pattern isn't traveling from person to person but that it's learned how to travel through the phone lines. He gets the EMC to cut the phone lines out of the valley, which they do just in time. As they cut the lines at a major nearby telephone juncture, the pattern has seized control and begun dialing random outgoing numbers on its own. Stephen soon realises that even the phone lines won't contain it. The pattern is continually learning and evolving and it's already figured out a way to transport itself without needing active phone lines. He decides the only way to permanently stop the pattern is to convince Clive and the EMC to call in a nerve gas airstrike on the valley, killing everyone and removing the pattern's primary source of energy, humans. Clive eventually agrees to call in the airstrike, despite the fact that his own family lives in the valley. Meanwhile, Stephen's uncle Frank, Wendy's brother who owns the farm, overhears Stephen and Clive on his own ham radio and realises what Stephen is trying to do. Frank has a near violent confrontation with Stephen and goes up to the nearby windmill and activates an old air raid siren in an attempt to warn everybody in the valley. The planes go ahead and drop their payload, the nerve gas spreads and everyone presumably dies. In the end, Yorton Valley is empty. Stephen survived the gas by hiding out in an underground bunker but he is taken by the pattern or maybe he accidentally sets himself on fire um, which it seems may be the case. Um, before he dies, he attempts to raise Clive on the radio but gets no response from him or anyone else. We're left to infer that the airstrike was unable to stop the pattern spread and that it has moved beyond the valley and claimed the rest of the world. Okay, so that's the main story wrapped up. But the real emotional satisfaction comes from understanding the non-apocalyptic echoes left behind by the residents' everyday lives. For every frantic radio call from Stephen or cryptic research memo from Kate, there's a memory from a longer time ago as two or three townspeople met, talked and wove a thread or two into the valley's ever-growing interpersonal cross-stitch. This bigger story is divided into six chapters, which you discover in order as you make your way clockwise through the valley. The chapters are named for Jeremy, Wendy, Frank, Lizzie, Stephen, and finally Kate. 
You'll be guided through each chapter by a globe of light that wordlessly reflects the personality of the character for which the chapter is named. For example, Jeremy's orb moves carefully and thoughtfully, Wendy's is pushy and assertive, Frank's is steady and sometimes emits a sound like the respirator that kept his wife alive, Stevens is frantic and agitated. Chapter 1 Jeremy the story starts with Father Jeremy. It's a good way to begin since as the resident man of the cloth, Jeremy gets around town a lot and talks with lots of the residents. During Jeremy's chapter we meet Dr. Phil Wade, a doctor at the local surgery and his assistant Barbara, both of whom turn up at various points throughout the story. Dr. Wade is doing his best to deal with increasing public panic as the pattern infects the populace and eventually he succumbs to the nosebleeds himself. We also first meet Amanda, who along with her husband Neil and their children attempted to leave Yorton but were overcome by Patton's sickness and wound up holding up in Barbara's by then abandoned house. Early on in Jeremy's chapter we learn that there's a rift between him and Wendy concerning the death of Mary. Mary is the late wife of Wendy's brother Frank. Remember, most of these memories occurred well before the event. Mary had become terminally ill and was in great pain. Wendy learned that at Mary's request, Jeremy helped her administer a lethal dose of morphine, ending her suffering. Wendy harshly reminds Jeremy that God will judge him for his actions and seems unwilling to forgive him, regardless of what Mary may have wanted. Throughout the later chapters, we see Jeremy from time to time. He walks the valley, finding and helping people in need and offering words of kindness and guidance to his parishioners. In one key scene, he sits with Frank, and Frank thanks him for helping Mary take her own life. He says that Jeremy did the right thing, and that he wishes he could have been strong enough to be there for her. Later, during Wendy's chapter, we see Jeremy and Wendy together again. It's in the evening on the night of the event, and Wendy finally forgives Jeremy. She tells him that Mary loved him very much and apologises for judging him so harshly. Jeremy survives longer than everyone around him and eventually finds himself alone in front of his church in Yorton proper. He angrily calls out to God and the pattern seems to speak back to him. He hears it and appears to think it's the voice of God. Standing at an altar in his church, he calls out to God before evaporating into light. Chapter 2 Wendy By the time Wendy's chapter comes into play, we already know her as the hard-nosed woman who was harsh on Jeremy. Her husband, Eddie, was a war veteran who died young. It's never quite clear what happened, but he apparently never fully recovered from the war, whether physically or mentally. Wendy doesn't approve of her son Stephen's new wife Kate, saying that Yorton isn't her place. She bristles at the insinuation that this is because Kate is black, rather, Wendy insists, it's because Kate, an American, is an outsider who will never fit in. Wendy doesn't think Stephen should have left Lizzie when he did and still wants them to be together. Despite the fact that Lizzie is also unhappily married, she arranges for Stephen and Lizzie to get a drink together, which winds up serving as the spark for their affair. Wendy also turns up in a nice scene during the night of the event in which she discovers Howard Lantham, a Falklands war vet who now runs the Yorton train station. Having a panicked PTSD flashback under the table in his office, Wendy bursts in the door, gets him up, and helps him come to his senses. It's a small but important illustration of how her forceful personality helped hold the community together. In the end, Wendy is left alone under the stars with a bag full of dead birds she's been collecting as she walks through the valley, looking for, but never quite finding, her son Stephen. Wendy hears the planes coming and calls out to her lost husband, Eddie who she hears flying home to her from war. Then she vanishes. Chapter 3 Frank Frank owns and operates the farm in the middle of the valley. There's no love lost between him and his nephew Stephen, though it's never really clear of why that is. He's good friends with a man named Charlie Tate, and the two are ham radio enthusiasts, who go by the call signs Lost Cowboy for Stephen and Travelling Sherlock for Charlie. He employs a young lad named Reese, and is also friends with the station manager Howard Lantham. Much of Frank's story intersects with the main narrative. His most important character note happens earlier, when he thanks Father Jeremy for doing what he couldn't, 
and helping his wife Mary end her life. He is friendly with Kate and appears to be the only townsperson to open up to her. He sympathises with how the rest of the town won't accept her and they seem to get along well. After learning that Stephen has convinced Clive to call in an airstrike, Frank takes Howard's air raid siren up to the windmill on his property to try to warn everyone. While he's surrounding the siren and waiting for the end, he comes to terms with the fact that he failed Mary. She was at peace with her own death and asked him to stay by her side as she died. He wasn't strong enough, left and went to the pub instead. In his final moments, he says that he's now strong enough to be there for her, and as the planes fly in and drop their bombs, he evaporates into light. Chapter 4 Lizzie After Stephen left her ten years ago, Lizzie had an accident that left her crippled and unable to walk properly. She's now married to Robert Graves, an alcoholic who owns an auto shop in the autumn. No one seems to think that much of poor Robert. Lizzie runs the Lakeside Holiday Camp, a large campground north of the lake. Lizzie first meets Kate after Stephen's return to Yorton. Kate is cold and dismissive, while Lizzie offers nothing but politeness. After Wendy arranges for Lizzie and Stephen to meet up for a drink, he tells her that he regrets leaving her. It's later revealed that Kate learned of that initial meeting, but their relationship was already on the rocks. Rather than being jealous, Kate is mostly just angry that Stephen thought he could keep it from her. Sometime after that, Lizzie and Stephen rekindle their romance. As you follow Lizzie's glowing light around the holiday camp, you may notice it has a second smaller ball of light orbiting it. That's because Lizzie was pregnant with Stephen's child when she died. Her pregnancy is first hinted at by Father Jeremy, who meets her on the campground and comments on her smoking in her condition. Before the pattern has learned how to transmit itself across long distances, a panicked Stephen, who knows ahead of everyone else how bad this really is, makes Lizzie promise to meet him in secret and escape through an underguarded train tunnel just as the quarantine is going into effect. He's on his way to meet her when he realises that the pattern can transmit itself without phone lines, which means that the quarantine won't work and their escape is futile. Stephen abandons his plan to leave with Lizzie and heads off to call Clive and beg him to call in the airstrike. Left alone at the train station, Lizzie leaves Stephen a message telling him she's going on without him because she has to think of the baby now. As she hangs up, the planes fly in dropping the gas. She and her baby vanish into the light. A few supporting characters factor into Lizzie's storyline. Most prominently, there's Rachel Baker, a 16-year-old whose mother and father, Evelyn and Sam Baker, have sent her off to work for Lizzie at the camp for the summer. Rachel is in love with a boy named Reese, a reformed juvenile delinquent who works for Frank at the farm. Her father, Sam, is an ill-tempered man who does not approve of Rachel and Reese's relationship. There's also Sean and Diana, or Di, a Welsh couple who make their way into the camp along with their baby Dylan during the event. As Sean and Di were hurrying to get out of town, they had a car accident with Lizzie's husband Robert, who was drunk and driving his truck on the wrong side of the road, ending with Robert's truck crashed into the river and Robert possibly wounded or dying. Sean and Di panic about their dwindling time to escape ahead of the quarantine and leave Robert in his truck taking shelter at the camp and confessing to Lizzie what happened. Rachel takes baby Dylan off of their hands temporarily, but eventually Sean and Di vanish, leaving Rachel alone with their baby. It seems Sean and Di are the couple who, as revealed during Wendy's chapter, tried to escape on the train tracks and were run over by the train, derailing it. Also, some characters hint at how Sean and Di never wanted baby Dylan, so it makes sense they'd leave their kid behind. Lizzie's resolution and the confirmation about her baby both occur during Stephen's chapter. Lizzie's own chapter actually closes with a big scene involving Rachel. Stuck at the camp, Rachel and Reese temporarily put their plans to flee on hold because Rachel has to look after baby Dylan. When Lizzie leaves, Rachel is left in charge of the rest of the kids at camp as well. The children have been rehearsing a summer production of Peter Pan 
and Lizzie has Rachel gather them into the main hall to rehearse and keep their minds off things. Rachel sits on the stage and sings a lullaby to baby Dylan as the planes fly in, dropping their payload on the entire camp, the kids and the rest of the valley. Chapter 5 Stephen Stephen's narrative weaves through all the others. Since Kate is locked in the observatory while he runs around like a madman outside, he has the most opportunities to interact with the rest of the cast. Over the course of his story, we see Stephen fall back in love with Lizzie, fight with Kate and run into a few of the other players. We see him preparing to move into a house in Little Tipworth, where he hopes he and Kate can be happy and make a life, despite Wendy's doubts. We see him grow increasingly agitated as he comes to terms with the unstoppable nature of the pattern, running into confused townspeople without explaining himself and generally annoying everyone. In one scene, Stephen runs afoul of Rachel's father, Sam Baker. When Sam finds Stephen stealing supplies out of his warehouse, Stephen tells Sam to stay back or risk being infected by the pattern. Sam attacks Stephen, and Stephen hits and possibly kills Sam with a hammer. Shop owner Meg Holloway and Frank's friend Charlie Tate witness the fight. After Stephen realises that all hope of non-violently containing the pattern is gone, he convinces Clive to drop nerve gas on the valley. He leaves a message for Kate at the observatory, saying the two of them will be the last humans alive in the valley, and that they have to kill themselves after the gas clears to ensure that the pattern dies with them. Stephen then locks himself down in an underground utility area where he prepares to kill himself. He's unable to reach the outside world on the radio and realises at that point it's likely that the pattern has already spread beyond the valley and that the world is ending. While in the utility bunker, Stephen recounts a story from his childhood. When he was younger, his father, Eddie, home from war, took in a wounded fox and attempted to nurse it back to health in the shed behind their home. Stephen tried to go back and feed it, but it bit him. His father killed the fox, explaining to Stephen that it didn't know what it was doing. It was just a wild animal. Stephen says he believes the pattern is no different. It doesn't realise it's hurting people, because it's just an instinctual intelligence. In his final scene, Stephen stands in a room filled with gasoline, prepared to drop a lighter and kill himself. As he stands there, the pattern appears to him and he angrily challenges it, waving his lighter and telling it that once he's gone, it will be all alone again like it was before arriving on Earth. Suddenly, he sees Kate in the pattern and, mystified, calls out to her before accidentally dropping the lighter and burning to death. Okay, the final chapter. Kate's chapter. Chapter 6. Throughout the game, we've come across Kate's scattered research logs as she stays in the observatory with the pattern, studying and communing with it. In the final chapter, we climb toward the sixth tower at Vallis Observatory. At each of the five sub towers, we listen to one of Kate's audio logs, which chronicle her time with the pattern. She appears to have learned to communicate with it, sharing her consciousness and senses with it. Kate has been cut off from the rest of the valley and manages to stay alive even after the gas drops. She believes that the pattern keeps her from dying. She confirms that the pattern has overtaken the wider world. Everything is light now, she says. Everything has come to rest. She's apparently been exploring the town and has found the lights that remain of the valley's residents. She actually has photos of them up at one of the towers. After communing with the pattern for an unknown amount of time, Kate says that she is now connected to all things. Before, when she looked at the light coming to our planet from many dying stars, she didn't understand. But she, but she says she does now. She says that she knows about Stephen and Lizzie, since she sees everyone and everything, but that she forgives them and wishes them happiness. She talks about how the pattern shows everyone happy. Jeremy has found God. Wendy has been reunited with Eddie, Frank is with Mary, and Lizzie and Stephen are together. We have each other, Kate says in her final audio log, presumably addressing the pattern itself. We lived apart from them. We understand now our failure to touch, to belong. But it doesn't matter anymore. Everybody is gone and we will join them. We are born apart, driftwood on the banks of an endless dark ocean 
and we will be carried away by the swell soon enough, but in between, in the single day of living, that dancing in a strip of sunlight, we can find what we miss, the love that makes us whole, the imminence, everybody found their other. This pattern is mine. Okay, so that's the end of the entire story and game. But what the hell does it all mean? Firstly, there's still a lot open for interpretation, especially Kate's chapter and the meaning of the actual event itself. However, there's one explanation that makes the most sense, taking into consideration all the pieces of information and what we can fathom as spiritual human beings. All the light in the universe has always been special. It contains the experiences and memories of the sentient beings it has absorbed. The pattern is that light in its purest form. It's a sort of singularity, the unification of all consciousness and time into a single eternal moment. By recognising the pattern in the star's light and amplifying it, Kate and Stephen brought it down to our world, where it could leap through our lines of communication and take us into itself. Kate says we each have an other, a personal entity that makes us whole. Frank has Mary, Wendy has Eddie, Jeremy has God, Stephen has Lizzie and so on. Kate's other is the pattern itself, which isn't explained in detail but that's the case. After being taken into the light, each character finds their other and is happy forever and ever, for eternity. So it would seem much less an apocalyptic event and more of a euphoric ending, which ultimately makes sense as the word rapture does, after all, mean a feeling of intense pleasure or joy. My name is Frank Jacob Appleton. And if you're listening to this, then maybe Stephen was right. And by sending the planes, he stopped it all getting worse. It's a beautiful morning. I wasn't there when Mary died. I was too scared. So I went to the pub instead. What will be, will be, Frank, she said. And I just want you to face it with me. And I didn't. But I will now. I will face it with you now, Mary. They're coming. Okay, that's it guys. I would love to see some comments below on what your experience was with the game and how you interpreted it. It would be great to see some discussions. If you like this video, please go ahead and click the like button. This will let me know to make more gaming videos like this. Hope you enjoyed and thanks for watching.